This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our Rapture Special. Now before we begin, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we're allowing the Spirit to control us. And this way we can get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the time, the privilege, the freedom that we still have to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been answering the big question about the rapture. When is it? And answering other questions along the way, we started comparing passages that describe the second coming in the Old Testament and then the New Testament. And now we're in the epistles of Paul. In our last lesson, we compared 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 through 10 with Luke 17, 24 through 30, where we saw that they were comparable and in fact actually complemented each other, describing the conditions and mentality of the general unbeliever population when Christ returns. We now turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where we see another passage on the parousia of Christ. Now, I use the word parousia to keep reminding you that this is translated coming. This is a key term when it comes to uh, eschatological studies. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. Let's just do those two verses. On the board, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming, the parousia, of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your mind or disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. In other words, they don't want them accepting some message that disturbs them on this subject. And in fact, with claiming the authority that it was from them, or at least that level of authority. So the opening two verses here tell us why Paul is writing this section of the letter. The subject is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. The major concern here is the coming and gathering in relation to the day of the Lord. Apparently, some spirit, that is teacher, message or letter, was saying that the day of the Lord had already come with some authority behind it. In other words, the false teaching was saying that they had missed the Lord's coming, which would include the rapture. And I put that in quotes because we now see it as the resurrection. Paul does not want this wrong information to quickly shake in them. The word there is saluo. It means disturbed inwardly. It really bothers them. It upsets them. And you can imagine it would. This is the kind of news that believers would react to quickly. Missing the day of the Lord and gathering to him would mean that they missed that change of body and being with the Lord forever. That something was wrong with their faith. They had been deceived. That meant that the only thing left for them was the final judgment and wrath of God. Oh my. You see the scriptures here, Isaiah 13, 9. We'll look at that. Lamentations 2, 2, Ezekiel 30, verse 3, Joel 1, 15, 2, 1, and 11, 3, 4, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, and so on. A number of scriptures on that wrath of God during the day of the Lord. Let's, let's look at uh, Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, The day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and destroy its sinners from it. Who wouldn't want to avoid that? So Paul is going to prove how this teaching that the day of the Lord had come was wrong. He gives two unmissable events that happened before the day of the Lord. No one can miss this especially believers. 
Let's go to verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, described as who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself that he is God. You cannot miss these two big events that happened before the day of the Lord. This tells us something about the day of the Lord. Before it comes, the apostasy and Antichrist show up. In other words, the day of the Lord occurs after the apostasy and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So what has happened to the Thessalonians, or we might say some of them, possibly some of them? Well, as he opens this Verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way. That's it. They've been deceived. Someone's deceived them. The word for deceive, exapatao, to cause someone to accept false ideas. They were deceived into thinking that the day of the Lord had already come. Now, let's think about this for a moment. Do they think Paul missed it too? How could their thinking be so off on this? Well, the point is, there's been some deception. Their thinking gets way off. Someone has misled them. And folks, there's a lot of people misleading a lot of Christians today. Now, there's some root causes of that. Things I've talked about before, a lot of it has to do with being controlled by the Spirit. A lot of Christians don't even consider that. They just assume it and don't make deliberate choices for it. That's a constant thing. Now, remember that this was believers showing good signs of spiritual growth. Remember that in 1 Thessalonians? They'd shown some growth in their faith and their endurance. So Paul will teach how they can't have possibly missed the day of the Lord because before it, two things come. All right, he says, let's just get back to our verses up high here, okay? Let no one deceive you in any way, for the apostasy comes first. Let's talk about the apostasy. Apostasia is the abandonment of established authority. Anytime there's an apostasy, someone has uh, ignored, abandoned, rebelled against authority. Authority of the Word of God, authority of God, authority of Christ. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. All right, that's the second thing. But let's stay at the apostasy for a second. Specifically for the believer, it is defiance of God, of Christ, and the Word of God, truth. It is rebellion against Christ, abandoning the faith. That's pretty scary. Let's look at some scriptures on this. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Notice, latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Well, that's going on to some degree right now. We are in those latter days. Matthew 24.9 Then they will dis- deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations for my namesake. Now that's happened to a certain degree now, but even more so during the tribulation. Let's go on. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. This is Jesus speaking. And many false prophets will, ar- will arise and lead many astray. There's your deception. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. People really don't care for each other. Isn't that the truth? So the first obvious event is that apostasy comes first, before the day of the Lord. Many believers will turn away from Christ, probably up to a third at this time. And I studied that in the section on apostasy in Lesson 10, 
on the saints in the tribulation special because of the deception, the false teaching, and persecution, many believers will betray the Lord Jesus Christ and other Christians. That's over in, uh, let's see if I have that up here, Second Thessalonians, excuse me, Matthew 24, 9 through 11, including family members to follow the Antichrist. I'll say that again. Because of the deception, the false teaching, and persecution, many believers will betray the Lord Jesus and other Christians. Matthew 24, 9 through 11, including family members to follow the Antichrist. Compare that with Matthew 10, 21. The second obvious event is that the man of lawlessness is revealed. He can't be missed. This is huge. This is the Antichrist. How could you miss a world ruler? He will not just be revealed. All right. In other words, he'll just not be, uh, will be able to see him, but he will publicly oppose any God or God himself and take his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself that he's God. He's going to claim himself to be God. Now, how can you miss that? It's like someone in Germany saying, well, you know, during the height of World War II, who was Hitler? Okay. None of these events can be missed. The day of the Lord will not come until both of these events occur first. The order of events is clear. First the apostasy, and the Antichrist is revealed, then the day of the Lord. Now, let me just say this. This presents a real problem for the pre-trib position, which holds that the day of the Lord is the tribulation period. Because Paul states clearly that the day of the Lord is after the apostasy and the revealing of the Antichrist. The scripture is clear that the Antichrist is present and active, even taking his seat in the temple at the midpoint of the tribulation. Now, they have a way of working around this problem. And I will admit it's difficult to understand. But basically, they create an interpretation trying to prove that this plain reading of the scripture is not what it says. And let me add that this plain reading of the scripture of the apostasy and Antichrist, then the day of the Lord, what I'm reading now, the way I'm teaching it now, is in complete agreement with our Lord's Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. And if you go back and look at that again, let me just re review it for you. Matthew 24, where Jesus speaks of, one, falling away in 24.10, two, then the abomination of desolation in 24.15-16, then the great tribulation, 24.21, which is the second half of the tribulation, by the way, four, then after the tribulation of those days, notice after the tribulation, that becomes important, especially later on, Sun darkened and so on, 2429. Five and six, then the Son of Man appears, coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, 2430. And then six, he has angels gather up his elect, 2431. I think it's interesting that if those who hold to the pre-trib position are present when the Antichrist is revealed, did you hear what I said? I'll say that again. I think it's interesting that if those who hold to the pre-trib position are present, I'm talking about those right now, for example, and the Antichrist was to show up the next couple of years, okay, something like that, and they haven't died yet, people haven't died. If they're present when the Antichrist is revealed, Will they be in a similar position to some of the Thessalonians? Will they think they've missed the rapture? Okay, well, let's move on to one of the topics that seems to divide the pre-tribbers with the post-tribbers and 
pre-tribbers with others as well, and that's avoiding the wrath. I want to cover that topic. That seems to be one of the major arguments that pre-tribbers have. Uh, avoiding the wrath. One of the major arguments that pre-tribbers use is that the Bible teaches that the bride, the church, does not go through the tribulation because that is the wrath of God being poured out. And they'll say things like, God would not pour out his wrath on the bride of Christ. The wrath is only poured out on the unbeliever, including the Jew who refused to accept Christ. So the church cannot be present. That's their reasoning. Therefore, the church is raptured before the tribulation. So that's their conclusion. One of the reasons the church doesn't go through the tribulation because that's the period of God's wrath. And it is true, there is wrath poured out. But there's an answer to this, and it's really quite easy. But let's look at the two issues here. There's two issues in this. Wrath and the bride of Christ. First, it is true. The wrath is not poured out on believers, including the bride. A lot of scriptures on that. Matthew 3, 7, Luke 3, 7. Just in principle, it doesn't happen. Okay? So you have a bunch of uh, passages that speak about the wrath of God not being poured out on believers. All right? Matthew 3, 7, that's John the Baptist talking, Luke 3, 7. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 6, Colossians 3, 6, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, and Revelation, a bunch of them. Revelation 6, 16, 11, 18, again, 6, 16, 11, 18, 14, 10, 16, 19, 19, 15. However, I want us to go to a key passage here in my view. Isaiah chapter 26. Here's why. Avoiding wrath can come in different ways. One can be protected while nearby, as did the Israelites in avoiding the plagues of Egypt, even having the Lord pass over their houses because they put blood on their door frame and side post. Exodus 12, 23. However, there is direct teaching on this subject of avoiding the wrath during this period in the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah prophesies of the day of the Lord. It is one of the clearest Old Testament passages on wrath and resurrection. In chapter 26, Isaiah writes of a song sung by believers when the Lord establishes his millennial kingdom. It speaks of resurrection. Isaiah 26:19. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for the dew is a, is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. This speaks of the resurrection. I'm not going to go into detail on this, other than just mention that's a resurrection passage. Now let's go to our main part here, verses 20 through 21, where it pictures the wrath of God pouring forth while the remnant is preserved. Now, this ultimate fulfillment is in the future. They sung this song. My understanding is that it, they sang it uh, during the millennium after all this happened. It's one of their celebration songs. Come, my people, into your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed by. For behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will disclose the blood shed on it and will no more cover its slain. Now, this is a type of attitude that the faithful should have when those bowls of wrath start being poured out. Now, the second issue, and I mentioned this, and it becomes an issue, especially if you're a dispensationalist, if you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, don't worry about it right now. But it has to do with the bride. 
when they claim the bride will be raptured away to avoid the wrath. You see, they see a strong separation between the church and Israel. And so the tribulation has nothing to do with the church because the church is gone. And that ties in well with their argument, at least to them, that God wouldn't pour his wrath on his own bride, on, on Christ's bride. The problem with this view is that Paul taught that all believers, whether Jew or Gentile, I have this on the board, are members together as the church, the bride of Christ. That's what's at the heart of Paul's teaching in Ephesians 2. I taught that, uh, I think it was earlier this year, I went to Ephesians. Great book. Let's just read some of that. On the board, Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, by the way, all believers in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away, that would be the Gentiles, who have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who made the both, Jew and Gentiles, one, okay, who made the both one, that's Jew and Gentile, one, and he destroyed the middle partition, the hostility, in the flesh by having rendered inoperative the law of the commandments, that's the uh, Mosaic law, in decrees, in order that he might create in himself the two, Jew and Gentile, into one new person. So making peace between them and God and that he might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile, in one body of Christ to God. Notice, body of Christ is made up of Jew and Gentile believers to God through the cross by which the hostility has been killed. Pretty strong term. In other words, the division is gone. Point being, both believing Jew and believing Gentiles are one new person. They are one body in Christ, Romans 12, 5. There is no difference in relation to Christ. They're both in Christ. Both are together as one body under the new covenant based on the blood of Christ, Matthew 26, 27 through 28. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink one spirit. We share the same spirit, Jew and Gentile. Now, another problem with this view is what about all those tribulational believers who die as martyrs during the tribulation? Are they not members of the body of Christ, the church? You see, the pre-tribbers have a difficult time with this, especially the old-timers, the, old, the ones who hold to the older dispensationalist view. I don't see how they sort this out. But there's really a basic problem here. It's really an issue of if you're going to hold to a view and you're going to be so stubborn on it without being open to other truth, uh, you better fix that be honest with you and that's tough talk but you've got to do that you can't stay with one view just because you like that view of course people would say well i don't want the wrath poured out on me i don't want to be here i've actually heard that argument that people say well you can go through the tribulation if you want to but i'm not see that's a complete misunderstanding and the issue to them is not really what the scripture says well, one more passage often enters the debate between pre-trib and other views. And we're going to look at that because it is one of their major passages. In fact, what they'll often do, and this is pre-tribbers, is just to show you their, their way of doing things. It's not to be highly critical of them or judgmental. It's just to show you their method and to show you what they do. They'll first take you to that rapture passage that we start out with in the study. Okay? About us all being caught up, gathered up. Okay, in a moment we're going to be changed. Okay, that was back in 1 Thessalonians 4. The passage we're going to look at is John 14. 
So they'll read that one to you, then they'll come back and read to you John 14. Let me just, uh, let's just just read through that for a moment, then I'll come back and analyze it a little closer. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is speaking, of course. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I, and prepare a place for you, I will come again, that's in their view, the rapture, and take you to myself, so that where I am, you will be also. And where I am going, you know the way. Now, first of all, the way Jesus puts this, especially towards the end here in these last couple of verses, should hint that there's something else going on. All right? It's way too simple to say this is a pre-trib rapture passage. And if you study John with me, you know that the Apostle John taught things that the other apostles did not, even in the Gospels. John's a fascinating study, especially talking about the Father and the Son being one, how they work with the believer and in the believer, dwell in the believer, so that you are actually and dwelt by the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Well, let's look at this passage, but let's get some background. I'm going to scroll back up for this. Background. Jesus is speaking in the upper room where the disciples have gathered to have the Last Supper, the very night of his arrest before the trials and crucifixion. Jesus had just spoke of Peter's denying him three times. And there's some scripture, Luke 22, 34, John 13, 38. The Last Supper is completed, and they share the cup for their Last Supper together. Okay, or that basically was one reason we call it the Last Supper. Uh, many call it communion. Luke 22, 17 through 20. So Jesus speaks, which we've already read. Now let's do a summary of what we see above. Expands okay. All right. One, the disciples are not to be troubled. I mean, after all, just think of what Jesus just told Peter. Tough times are coming. Christ is about to be arrested and crucified the next day. Two, so what do they need to do? Verse 1, believe in God, believe also in me. They need to trust God. They need to put themselves completely. They need to believe in God and his plan and believe in Jesus. Everything's under control. There's a dwelling place for them with the Father in his house. Keep that in mind. Point four, Jesus is going to go and prepare it. He will do this through his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus will prepare an eternal dwelling place for his disciples. Now, he's got to go prepare a place. Now, think about this. Some people view this as he's going to go to heaven. But it just says he's going to go prepare a place. But he hasn't been to the cross yet. So he has to do that. But we do know he's going to go and be uh, crucified and resurrect. Point five. If he goes, and he will, he will come back and take them to himself, though, that wherever he is, they will be. So how do we piece all this together? All right. Let's broaden the context. We just left off, and where I am going, you know the way. Verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How are we able to know the way? Okay, now it gets interesting. How are we able to know the way? So Thomas is confused. Jesus has just said in verse 4, that you know the way. Okay, got it up here. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How are we able to know the way? You see, they actually did know the way. They did know how to follow Jesus, and they knew how to get to that dwelling place. So Jesus clarifies it for them. Verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is not talking about a dwelling place in heaven or even the new heavenly Jerusalem. He's talking about the way to the Father and dwelling with him is through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The point is that if you want to be with the Father and dwell with him, I'll say it again. The point is that if you want to be with the Father and dwell with him, then believe in God and Jesus Christ. Jesus elaborates on this in verse 7 and following. He goes on to say, if you know me, you know the Father, verse 7. Philip asks to see the Father. Jesus answers, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, 8 and 9. So he's, he's uh, uh, describing how he and the Father are one, okay? They're both God as one. Jesus elaborates on the believing he called for, verse 10. Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? That's part of their faith. Do they believe that? He's been teaching that. The words that I say to you, I do not speak from my own, but the Father abiding in me. Notice the Father abiding in me does his works. One of the reasons Jesus was so obedient is because the Father indwelt him. He did the works of the Father. Then Jesus relates to prayer, how he and the Father work together, including prayer. He relates all this to prayer. Now listen to verse 19. We're going to jump ahead here because I want to get to our point. After a little while, the, the world will no longer see me. So Jesus is going away. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. Now that seems like a contradiction. The world won't see me, but you'll see me. How will they see him? Remember, they're believers. And that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. These are big hints, if you know your scripture, about where this is going. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Notice the close connection between Jesus and the Father. If you want to know the Father, you want this close relationship, we call it fellowship or in Christ, then obedience is necessary. Notice, I will love him and disclose myself to him. Jesus is going to reveal himself to them. Stay with me here. A little sidetrack here. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what has happened that you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Hmm, interesting question put up by an unbeliever. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. Now, how does that happen? How does a father and a son have a dwelling place within believers. First of all, notice the our dwelling place. That's the Father and Jesus will dwell with the believer. How does this happen? Verse 26, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance everything that I said to you. So, let me just say this. You know the scripture. You picked up on this probably earlier. This involves the Holy Spirit. This involves the coming of the Spirit. 
The way we dwell with the Father and have fellowship with Jesus Christ is through the Spirit. But Jesus had to go, die, be buried, and resurrect. He had to go to the Father and then send the Spirit, and through the Spirit, we dwell with the Father and the Son. He is with us, and they are with us always. So this verse in John 14, this passage, has nothing to do with the pre-trib rapture or even the second coming of Christ. It has to do with the future and dwelling of the Godhead with the believer, I should say within the believer, through the Holy Spirit. That's what that passage means. Well, we'll pick up from here next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your truth, for the revelation of Jesus Christ, for your plan. Give us strength. Give us insight. Help us through your spirit to understand and apply these things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.